research and i'm sure you know uh, in the spirit of discussion we will have a very good discussion on the after the, after i am done with the presentation so basically i'm going to talk about um, my phd research in virginia tech uh, like tondo the mentioned on front propagation and feedback in convective flow fields now uh, i'm currently a postdoc at university of minnesota and this is my website if anyone's interested in the so i've tried to compile my you know latest publications and latest research updates in my website and this is the website of my supervisor in virginia tech his his name is mark paul and uh, you know he does all sorts of cool research in non non equilibrium physics and pattern formation and we all the you know majority of the works that that i'm going to show you is basically collaboration with him uh, during my phd um so i i just uh, graduated in may 2020 and before that i um uh, had a bachelor's in mechanical engineering in 2015 from jalalpur university india so uh, before moving on i guess the key word for this is front now what is a front uh, that's i guess the you know that the important question now front can be defined as a region of separation between two distinct states of a system two distinct physical states so for example you know you can have a chemical reaction and a front would be the interface which separates the products and reactants in a chemical reaction so for example these are simulations here uh, where you know suppose you have a petri dish and you incite a reaction in the middle of the petri dish you will see the reaction front that's propagating outward until all the reactants in the domain are consumed so um, here for instance the red uh the color red is the concentration of the of your chemical species uh which is normalized here between 0 and 1 so a c of 1 is the product and a c of 0 is the reactants which is shown in blue and the front is basically the region like i said that separates these two states so anything which is around c of 0.5 can be defined as a front okay so fronts are very ubiquitous in nature um and you know you have you can have fronts which are as 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 the definition goes it's the separation of two distinct physical states so in theory you can have a front of in turbulence where you can have a front that separates laminar and turbulent flow um you can also have so this is my favorite example for fronts so this is a forest fire front from the psychological modeling paper by Hargrove and these are simulations of forest fire so suppose you have a deciduous forest um and you incite a fire inside the forest now the forest fire front that will propagate until all the vegetation is consumed and it will not stop until then so the so the forest fire uh, the uh, front that separates the uh, vegetation fresh vegetation from the burnt vegetation is basically your uh, forest fire front and then you have fronts in combustion in polymerization reactions um and fronts also give rise to plumes so this is a, uh, this, this is actually from an experiment by steven morris in U university of toronto where they actually studied uh, plume propagation so you know this is a tube in which you have a, a reactants a reactant and you basically incite a reaction here and the products are basically lighter than the reactant so they give rise to this interesting spatial temporal structures uh, called plumes which go up so you know these plumes are very important in uh, kind of industrial effluence you know you have seen seen them in smokes such as cigarette smokes so uh, all this kind of interesting neat physics and interestingly another thing that i'll cover is that how fronts kind of modify the fluid mechanics so reaction advection diffusion equations can the front uh, or the front as it propagates it can also modify the underlying fluid mechanics giving rise to oscillations um which uh, has been recently reported in this uh, publication prl so in you know in gen in general the front propagation is modeled using a reaction call in using an equation called the reaction advection diffusion equation so suppose you have a flow field where you know this f this function is your flow field is your variation of navier stokes equation you know buzanesk equation whatever and this flow field is basically coupled with this reaction advection diffusion equation through this coupling term this is advection um now c again is the concentration of your species so this equation tells us that the concentration changes because of the advection because of diffusion because the species diffuses and also because of this reaction so this is the nonlinearity of reaction 
Now, for all the studies so forth, uh, there are different kinds of nonlinearity, but I have stuck with uh, this quadratic uh, function uh, for the nonlinearity. It's called, uh, it has a hefty name called the Fischer Kolmogorov Petrov Gushkinov nonlinearity, but all that it is is that it's the simplest kind of nonlinearity that you can cook up. Um, it shows up in population dynamics, autocatalytic chemical reactions. All this means is that the state of C equal to one or products is stable and the state of C equal to zero or the reactants is unstable. So the system always tries to evolve such that it goes to the state of C equal to one. So, and next in the talk, I'll also cover how the mechanism of feedback. So what happens is sometimes, you know, your reaction attraction diffusion equation can modify the underlying fluid dynamics by, um, by you know, some kind of a coupling. Uh, between them and this is what we call as feedback and I'm going to show from our equations how this you know how we realize this feedback mechanism okay so all all this work is computational and um, so for for us the computational domains that we have used are basically convection domains so really banana convection is basically uh, the most simplest uh, you know system of convection so you have this you know this is a cylindrical um, domain. Uh, this is a rectangular domain and this is a two-dimensional rectangular domain which I'll come later on in the talk. But all these domains are high aspect ratio uh, domains where you can study convection. So really Bernard convection is when you know you keep the bottom plate uh, for, of this enclosed domain and you keep, keep the top plate to be cold. And so what will happen is after a certain temperature difference you will uh, visualize or you will see convection rolls that develop in the domain. So suppose you are basically boiling water for tea or something in a saucepan and you know after a certain temperature difference you will see convection rolls. Hot fluid will go up and cold fluid will go down and the convection rolls form in pairs like the schematic here. Um, and um, you know so so the chain of vortex uh, here we, we can see a chain of vortex that forms here after a certain temperature difference. Now if you visualize this domain from top you will actually see stripes here because the convection roll edges actually show up as stripes. And this is an example of pattern formation. So this is the simplest kind of type one uh, bifurcation where you know, a, cis, a state, uh, a steady state, if you just increase the control parameter, for this case, the temperature difference, you eventually you uh, give rise to a pattern or spatial variation um, of, in the system. So uh, basically, and I, yeah, so another thing, uh, that is, I guess, interesting from or important from a uh, computational point of view is that all my, for the fluid dynamics, all my fluid velocities are no slip uh, in the material surfaces. For the concentration, I'm using a no flux boundary condition um, at the material surfaces. Uh, I'm using, for the temperature, I'm using perfectly conducting sidewalls. And of course, the top and bottom are always at uh, TH and TC, some arbitrary you know, temperature variation, which is normalized, so it's between zero and one. So this this is the uh, quintessential really Bernard convection uh, set of equations, which actually you can derive from your Navier-Stokes equation by using this approximation. This is called the Buzanesque approximation. So what this approximation says is that the density variation, because of the heat or because of the temperature difference, is can be modeled as a first order variation in uh, temperature. So beta here is a thermal expansion. Curve. So we, we are still assuming incompressibility. We are still saying that the fluid is incompressible. But what we are saying is the momentum equation will now have to account for the Buzanesque approximation, which shows up in the momentum equation as this term uh, here, um, you know, RA times T, where RA is the Rayleigh number. Now, Rayleigh number is the control parameter of this problem. Uh, Rayleigh number is basically uh, your non-dimensional temperature difference. It's the ratio of your buoyancy to your viscous um, forces. Um, secondly, you have the reaction advection diffusion equation, which we studied before. And this is now coupled with the flow field um, through this advection term. Now, there are some parameters which I'll go through. Um, one is the sigma, which is the Prandtl number. And we have fixed our Prandtl number to a value of one, which is uh, consistent with, you know, mixture of gases uh, generally have a Prandtl number of one. Then we have the Lewis number, which shows up in the, you know, outside the Laplacian for the concentration. Now, Lewis number is actually a non-dimensional diffusion coefficient. 
So all these equations here are non-dimensionalized, are scaled. So the length scale here is d, which is the depth of the convection layer. The time scale is the time it takes for heat to diffuse from bottom to top. The temperature scale is the temperature difference. And for the concentration, we use the initial concentrations in the domain, A0, as the concentration scale. So, and um, another term here, which is important, is the xi, which is our reaction rate. So, you know, xi multiplies this production term. So as you increase xi, you have more and more stronger and stronger reaction. We have fixed the value of xi to a value of nine non-dimensional units, um, uh, keeping keeping in mind, you know, the dam Kohler and Peckley number, which I'll come later in the discussion. Now, uh, now, basically, to if we want to realize feedback in this kind of system, the situation becomes tricky. Now, two ways, there are two ways that I have studied, uh, you know, front-induced feedback. One is solutal feedback. So when you're, you know, you have a chemical reaction where the products and the reactants are at different densities, then that instability uh, gives, uh, you have to add that in the Bosonesque approximation. And if you go around with the de derivation, you actually add a term in the momentum equation as RAS, where RAS is your salutary number. And this is basically the ratio, again, of buoyancy to viscous forces, where buoyancy is now produced by the difference in densities between the products and the reactants. And then you have this term, uh, eta times C times 1 minus C. Now, this is from an exothermic reaction. Now, suppose your chemical reaction is exothermic, then it will release heat. Or, you know, if it's endothermic, then it's just a change of sign. But it will, there will be a change of heat uh, in your system. And that will affect the temperature equation, which will, in on the other hand, affect the fluid uh, velocity. So to account for that, we have this term uh, called eta times C times 1 minus C, where eta is your heat release parameter. Um, uh, which basically, as you increase eta, you increase your um, exothermicity from the chemical reaction. Now, eta is related to the enthalpy of the chemical reaction and also to the reaction rate here. So I'm going to just go over this slide real quick. We basically compute the front velocity using this integral approach, which is called you know, the bulk burning rate. It's the it's a mathematically rigorous definition of uh, front velocity where you know it's just a spatial integral of partial c partial t, and in cylindrical geometry it just boils down to this uh, expression here, and shown are basically two pictures of fronts which are propagating in no flow, so there is no fluid uh, motion in the background and it's just a reaction diffusion equation that's propagating. And we wanted to just, you know, convince ourselves that this gives us the theoretical value of front velocity for this simple system, uh, which is this quantity here. And we do get that uh, value here. So just to, you know, just for uh, convenience. Uh, and then we have another two uh, important quantities, which is the reaction zone thickness. So you can see the front has a finite thickness here, which can be quantified by this quantity, which scales as basically Lewis number over xi square rooted um, from, you know, initial papers by Kolmogorov, Petrovsky, and Krishnov. And also there is another important quantity called, you know, the mixing length. And mixing length is essentially the spatial region uh, between this angle bracket C uh, of 0.01 to 0.99. Now, everything is non-dimensionalized, of course. So it's state of, again, state the blue is C of 0 and the red is C of 1. So this integral quantity, uh, actually, if you integrate this quantity and if you basically, uh, you know, calculate this mixing length, it gives you a length scale of reactive mixing. So this is where your reaction is actually happening in the domain. Um, so, you know, if anyone has any uh, questions up to this point, you are free to ask me. Otherwise, I'll just skip to the results. Yes, so basically I wrote in the chat box, uh, all the audience, you can post your questions uh, in the chat box. We can discuss in the later. And if Saikat is uh, okay, we can take the questions in between also. So just to make it more interactive, I think it will be good. Okay, okay. So what I suggest is, you know, if you have anything very pressing that, you know, that is keeping you from following the talk, just, just uh, you know, interrupt yes. me. Yes. I will, I will answer it. If you have anything which is other than that, I will probably answer it that after the talk. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, so I'll move on then to the results. Uh, so 
what we are seeing here is basically the x y plane of a straight parallel convection rolls so straight parallel convection rolls like i saw like i told you that you know from x y plane it, it will show up as stripes in your flow field so red here is hot rising fluid and blue is cold descending fluid and we get this flow and get this pattern by use, inducing hot side walls to this domain uh for this particular pattern our wave number is about pi um and we can only maintain this pattern for a really number uh, up to about 6900 above a really number of 6900 what we this uh, straight parallel rolls becomes unstable due to a skew varicose instability um but it this is good enough for us to study fronts you know in this pattern now here i'm going to show you a couple of simulation of you know reaction advection diffusion fronts which are propagating in this flow field the black solid lines in this plots are basically the centers of the convection rolls now we visualize them in experiments by shadow graph but in simulations we just do take the temperature contours of you know p of 0.5 and these are our centers of the convection rolls and this is the reaction that was started here that the front is now propagating towards the right now again the red is the products blue is the reactants the the only difference between the top and the bottom figure is that the bottom is 10 times less diffusive than the uh, than the you know the top figure so what what happens is that because of the lesser diffusion in the bottom uh, figure the front is largely affected by the flow, fluid flow so advection is more important for the bottom one so what happens is that you can see discontinuous regions of the front propagation you know if we visualize this from a xz point of view uh we have the convection rolls which are shown as vector arrows here and we have the uh, solid lines which are basically level sets of c of 0.5 so you know lewis number of 1 or a uh, higher diffusion coefficient we see that it imparts a s kind of a figure uh, because of the convection rolls which you know uh, turn it uh, turn the front uh, in their respective directions but for lewis number 0.1 we see that the front is now having having to do all sorts of interesting shapes of cusps and bends and you know in long time it also uh, there is discontinuities in the front so it tells us that lesser diffusion helps in uh, helps for the flow field to have a larger influence on the front geometry and we'll see in a bit that how that becomes important so now i'm jumping on to chaotic flow fields now this is a simulation of a really banard convection in a high aspect ratio large aspect ratio cylindrical domain at a really number of 6000 um now in this state uh, this is this is a state where the convection rolls actually undergo different sorts of geometric adjustments and you see all sorts of interesting shapes spirals defects show up so this state is called spiral defect chaos and we actually a uh, shout out to eduardo who's probably listening to this talk we actually recently published a paper on spiral effect chaos mm. as well um in a physical review to it but this state is the state of spiral effect chaos at really number of 6000 and what we are visualizing right now is temperature field where temperature you know uh, red is hot and blue is cold and we are seeing the mid plane of the cylindrical domain the horizontal mid plane of it so at higher really number or really number of 13000 uh we have you know the convection rolls which now have a kind of oscillations as it evolves so these oscillations you can see that axial oscill traveling oscillations so this uh, convection rolls actually develop this it's called oscillatory instability um at higher values of really number uh, now this is actually a uh, this oscillatory instability is we also call it like to call it weak turbulence because basically this gives rise to turbulence at higher and higher really number or higher and higher temperature difference um this is a route from chaos to turbulence that that i'm not going to cover here but you know this oscillatory instability will have a large uh, will have important influence in our fronts as we will see as well now a, a quick point quick note on chaos now i i guess we all hear about chaos a lot in our different kind of discussions but what and i'm calling this flow field chaotic and why i'm calling this chaotic is also a interesting i guess point to elucidate on so what we mean by chaos is essentially that these flow fields have yield a spectrum of positive lyapunov exponents 
uh, which is indicative of high dimensional chaos now what what do i mean by lyapunov exponents now basically your the equations that i showed you if you uh, add a small perturbations to these equations and if you evolve those perturbations in time uh, you you can actually quantify that evolution using something called the lyapunov exponent now if your system has shows up positive lyapunov exponents that is indicative of that system um of to be you know chaotic so that's the most i think rigorous definition of chaos um, that's um, you know that's there so we'll see the implication of that as well and there's a lot of work on that by my supervisor mark paul uh, which you can check in his website okay so now i'm going to study fronts in these flow fields and you know this is how the fronts evolve radially outward in these flow fields what we are seeing here is that you know the difference between the left and the right is the oscillatory instability that i talked about and you can see that the front geometry is extremely complicated in the left but it's more complicated even even more so in the right the reason being that the you know the spiral defect the roles which are uh, undergoing spiral defect chaos they impart rich geometry to the front interface and in the right as well the fronts impart this rich geometry along with the oscillation which you know which impart this uh, self simple or you know a fractal like structure to also come to see later on so jumping on to some results we actually did a bunch of simulations and we uh, basically tabulated the front velocity as a function of the characteristic fluid velocity so characteristic fluid velocity u is the maximum fluid velocity that we get in the middle of the domain um so if you plot it actually for straight parallel rolls we have this kind of a variation so for small values of uh, really number small values of fluid velocity we actually see this quadratic relation it's actually can be recovered using perturbation expansions and this was also you know uh, covered by um, you know published by Clavin and Williams and they have in 1979 so it's a really old study but but our study also matches their kind of analogy now for large values of fluid velocity um you actually find this kind of scaling of 0.31 uh for the front velocity with the fluid now uh, as 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 i said earlier we couldn't go beyond the value of 6900 because the rolls becomes unstable but we extended the scaling uh, further down to compare it with chaotic flow fields now if i plot the red points are results in chaotic flow fields where again the front velocity scales as u to the power of 0.27 um now here a quick note is that these are actually results from three simulations which are averaged to get more statistically significant data because of the chaos so we did three simulations each and the error bars actually see uh, show the average you know of the uh, uh, are representative of the three simulations and the red points are average of those um uh, values so for chaotic flow fields the interesting takeaway is that the chaotic fronts in chaotic flow fields are actually slower than you know the respective fronts in um, the straight parallel rolls so the white dots are actually faster than you know the red dots and so that 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 is very interesting now what happens is if you keep increasing the fluid velocity or keep increasing the really number for chaotic flow fields eventually the uh, red points or as shown here by green diamonds here they take over the equivalent velocity for you know the straight parallel rolls so the fronts in chaotic flow fields ultimately becomes faster than their counterparts in straight parallel rolls now the same thing happens for you know lewis number 0.1 which is an order 10 less diffusive uh, we again see that the fronts in straight parallel rolls are faster however the fronts in chaotic flow field become you know they take over after this critical you know transition here uh, with this green points and this green points are actually after the oscillatory instability that i talked about where the rolls develop temporal oscillations in them um okay so the question is then so then why are fronts in chaotic flow fields initially slower and then the question is what happens uh, after the oscillatory instability so why is that you know that point that uh, oscillatory instability significant um so to understand this uh, it's a twofold Uh, question one is the orientation of the convection rolls so as we saw that the chaotic convection rolls are actually oriented at different angles 
and the front actually front uh, interface is also oriented in very complicated uh, kind of you know geometries so we define a reaction zone angle phi but phi is basically the angle between radial your radial direction and your wave vector local wave vector of the uh, convection rules so and the way we define phi it varies from 0 to pi pi over 2 so 0 to 90 degrees and this is just a schematic with the c equal to 0.5 level set um, black are the convection rules and the green is your you know is the front so you know to visualize uh, how p is important uh, consider this consider a field of straight parallel convection rules and you have a radially propagating front that's propagating outward now the convection rules which are aligned with the direction of propagation of the front these these regions speed up whereas the you know the uh, front front uh, direction which is not aligned with the convection rules so actually perpendicular to the fluid uh, convection roll direction they actually do not speed up and that's why you know our initial radial uh, you know circular front becomes an ellipsoidal kind of a shape because of the unequal or asymmetric uh, contribution of the fluid velocity to here so here we have plotted the reaction zone angle phi the colors of it uh, the reds are of course pi over 2 where we see the front is actually you know slowest and it actually propagates with the theoretical value of v naught which is the just the reaction diffusion velocity because there is no fluid contribution in this direction whereas here the front is fastest so a phi of zero the front is velocity here we are plotting the front velocity here is fastest whereas at the phi of pi over two the front is slowest so you know this variation and this oscillations in this data are due to the convection due to the convection rules uh, as the front propagates so, so it tells us that orientation of the convection rules is very important. And this brings me to the chaotic flow fields again. So, you know, for daily number of 3000, we see that the, there are reaction zone angles which are away from zero, so which will slow down the front. So there are convection rules which are away from zero, which slow down the front in convection, in chaotic, um, you know, simulations, in chaotic flow fields. And same, same here for real number 9000, although here the geometry is also very complicated. So we can again plot the front velocity as a function of the uh, phi or you know, the reaction zone angle. And we see for you know, lower values of Rayleigh number, there's a weak trend. So any reaction zone angle which are away from zero actually take away or slow down the front, which is why we were seeing that you know, partially the fronts in chaotic flow fields were actually slower than their counterparts in straight parallel rolls. Whereas for higher values of Rayleigh number, we see that you know there is there is there is no trend actually. There is the there is very little to no trend for higher values of Rayleigh number. So the question is, what happens then to the you know higher values of Rayleigh number when there is oscillatory instability? So to answer that question, we see this movie first. So this is a three-dimensional. All the simulations are three-dimensional simulation. So this is a three-dimensional uh, level set of the front that's propagating at Rayleigh number of 13,000. So, you know, an oscillatory instability. We see that the structure is extremely complicated geometrically. And, you know, it, it, it is discontagious. It's discontinuous in places and it's very complicated. So to quantify that complexity, we actually uh, quantify them as fractals. So, um, you know, so basically these are level sets of C, C0.5 contours at um, Rayleigh numbers which are which have crossed the oscillatory instability limit. So you can see here the level sets uh, have discontagious pieces and it's extremely complicated uh, in terms of the shape. And so what we find is that these shapes are actually fractals with non-integer box counting dimension. So a little uh, initiation for fractals for those who don't know, but the idea of fractal dimension or non box counting dimension is that, you know, if you um, so we are used to dimensions such as one, two, uh, and three, right? For one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional uh, objects or spaces. Now, fractal dimensions are non-integer dimensions. So what this tells us is that some, some geometric objects have uh, basically dimensions of 1.15 or you know 1.3. In in actual reality, many natural shapes, such as you know, you take the clouds, you take the you know, continents, you know, shape of islands, they are all fractals. So you can actually pad those images using box counting dimensions 
and you can compute a fractal dimension. So uh, what this means is that if you zoom into this figure more and more, you will d discover new and new um, shapes which you didn't did not notice in your present scale. So the way it's computed is you take this kind of a shape, you pad this with a number of boxes, and you count the number of boxes which cross this shape. And you, you know, so n is the number of boxes here, and epsilon b is the size of the box. Now, as you basically, you know, increase the or you know decrease the size of your boxes, you keep the count on, and you can actually find find the box under limited uh, uh, dimension by this limit of uh, by this expression here, while limiting of you know epsilon b going to zero. In actual practice, we just you know plot a number of these values and we see where it's kind of reaching a you know this this log log plot is le reaching a uh, slope and we ca calculate the slope to uh, calculate our box on the dimension. So uh, we calculated the box counting dimension for a bunch of these, you know, fractal fronts, and we saw that you know they increase with the complexity of your of the uh, Rayleigh Bernard convection. So your epsilon in the x-axis is basically your Rayleigh number, which is normalized with the critical value of Rayleigh number, critical value of convection for Rayleigh number, and y-axis is a reduced box counting dimension. So you find that as you increase the daily number, you actually increase the uh, non-integer box on dimension to significant values of 0.15. And um, you know the green points here are after the oscillatory instability. And we see that there is actually a hike up after the oscillatory instability in those green points in terms of box on dimension. So to complete the story for our first part, we we have showed that you know fronts in chaotic flow fields are largely slower than the fronts in you know, state parallel roles. The reason being that the fronts are away from uh, uh, the, are not oriented in the convection along the uh, convection roles, which is why they are you know at, at a orientation of reactant zone angle, which is away from zero, which is why it slows down. However, for for after the oscillatory instability, you have front velocity which increases because of the geometry. So for you know when there is a box counting uh, for box counting dimension when there is a fractal geometry it increases the surface area between the products and the reactants which increases the reaction strength and the flow speed or the front speed in those regions so the increment is partly due to the fractal front interface and the slowdown is due to the reaction zone angle now the results so far were actually published in Mukherjee and Paul PRE 2019 uh, if you're interested you can take a look at the paper um, Shondon, how am I doing with time? Uh, yeah, don't worry. Just go on. It's an interesting talk. So we are very much flexible with time. OK. okay, sounds okay. So now I'm going to just straight away uh, jump into feedback. Um, so you know, so I, I was talking before you know, in the start that you know, the fronts can feed back to the flow field uh, using either salutal uh, feedback mechanism where the products and the reactants are at different densities. Or it can be a thermal feedback where the, your chemical reaction is exothermic, and it, of course, it can be a combination of the two, where you know thermal and solid feedback occur together. Um, I should mention that you know a bunch of this work on feedback has been done by this group of called nonlinear physical chemistry unit in University Libre de Brussels by Anne Dewitt and Lawrence Ronzi. So you should check out their you know web pages, which have very beautiful. Uh, physical chemistry, nonlinear physical chemistry experiments and simulations. It's beautiful stuff um, in their website. Um, so what I'm, I was interested in is how this kind of feedback, um, you know, is uh, realized in convective flow fields. And there, there hasn't been uh, any study which qualitatively shows that except for ours at this point. But, you know, this is a very interesting aspect because this kind of feedback is uh, present in many geophysical scenarios like I talked about plumes but uh, an example that I've not shared here but you know there are uh, theories that you know autocatalytic plumes and pinch off events actually give rise to uh, solar uh, stellar events in stars so, you know the, in the stars the way the combustion happens and the way the stars um, uh, release you know so, uh, like solar flares and stuff and those are those mechanisms are also related to this uh, kind of reaction generated feedback to the flow field. And there's a lot of literature on that, which if you're interested, I can share. But you know, moving on, uh, 
first I'm going to talk about solutal feedback. So where the products and the reactants in the chemical reaction vary in density. So for starters, uh, let's just study a front which is propagating in the absence of a flow field. So here you have a front which is propagating in the absence of a flow field and your solutal Rayleigh number, which remember is the uh, Rayleigh number like quantity, but because of the solutal instability. So it's a ratio of uh, buoyancy to the viscous forces where buoyancy is caused by the difference in density between the products and the reactants. So RS of zero, uh, the reactant diffusion, it's just a normal reactant diffusion front. As you increase the solute number, you actually uh, induce a small clockwise rotating uh, roll, uh, velocity roll, or a clockwise rotating vortex along with the front. Now this happens because the products in red are lighter than the reactants in blue for a, you know, for a positive solute rate number. Now, because of that, the products go up, the reactants go down, and you develop this kind of a flow field structure, which is a large, which is a large vortex, vortex which becomes stretched and kind of asymmetric as you increase your cellular layer number. I can show you a movie real quick of this simulation where, you know, as the front propagates, you can see that it's actually driving in fluid here, where you know the fluid is a self-organized uh, fluid role which actually propagates with the front as a property. And of course, the flow field vectors are shown by the vector arrow here, and the colors are uh, red products, blue reactants, and green front, which is uh, consistent throughout the rest of the talk as well. So we actually went ahead and calculated the front and fluid velocity again for this uh, problem, and we plotted it with our control parameters, which is now the solutal Rayleigh number. Uh, now, fluid velocity, uh, plots with the solutary number. Um, so let's, let's uh, these are both log, log, plots. Uh, now, what happens to the fluid velocity is that it, first, it actually varies linearly with the solutary number for solutary numbers between zero and one. But for larger values of solutary number, they actually vary as uh, square root of the solutary number. And there is a transition between these two regimes, which is shown by these green points here. Uh, same thing happens with the front velocity, where front velocity actually transition from a quadratic uh, uh, variation to a square root variation and with the solute Rayleigh number. Now, the square root variations were also reported by um, uh, Lawrence Ronzi and Anna DeWitt in uh, Journal of Chemical Physics in 2007. There is a really nice paper on that where they reported the square root variation. But we found this uh, linear variation of fluid and a quadratic variation of the front velocity here, uh, which was interesting. And we wanted to know why that was happening. So, you know, and the same thing happens with the reactive mixing length. If you remember, the mixing length is the spatial region where the reaction happens. So the mixing length basically changes from quadratic to, again, a square root. Region. So to kind of analyze that, we did a perturbation expansion. So first we are in two dimensions. So this. So we can actually cast our equations in stream function vorticity formulation. And then we can actually expand uh, our stream function vorticity and our concentration in um, powers of uh, solute rate number, RES. So it's a straightforward expansion which we feed it in this equation. I'm not gonna go into depth on you know the individual equation, but I'm gonna show you the solutions at each order. So at order zero, we do, do not have any fluid velocity, and we have this just a reaction diffusion front without any attraction. At order one, we have this um, symmetric variation of in concentration where so these dotted lines are actually negative contours of concentration, and the positive, and the positive uh, contours are shown in by the solid lines. And for the fluid velocity of the stream function, we see this you know uh, symmetric clockwise roll. Uh, which we saw for the fluid velocity. At um, second order, uh, we see that the concentration is now asymmetrically varying um, with respect to um, the phase, whereas the fluid uh, velocity or the you know the stream function is actually a quadruple now. It is still asymmetric uh, quadruple of fluid velocity. Now, why this is important is because we now know that you know at order one, the uh, the fluid velocity is varying because of this. Uh, Ex uh, because of this contribution of this clockwise rotating goal. But at order one, uh, basically the front velocity and the mixing length, which are both, if you remember, are calculated using this integral over z. So these become zero because of this 
symmetric contribution here. So if you do an integral here, these will give you a zero. So that's why the the front velocity as well as the mixing length actually are zero at order one and they start from order two. And we actually verified our numerics and perturbation expansions with full numerical solu solutions from our uh, data. And we found that you know the perturbation expansions give us really nice agreement with the actual data. So it tells us that the you know, at small values of RES, the scalings are because of this symmetry argument that we can see from the perturbation expansion. So now, uh, now we add convection to our to our front. So now we are studying what happens when there is a chain of convection rolls in our two-dimensional domain, and we increase the solute Rayleigh number. So at the small values of solute Rayleigh number, nothing happens or nothing significant happens. But at larger values of solute Rayleigh number, we see that you know, there is this instability that, that grows because the products are lighter than the reactants and you have this interesting kind of snout-like feature um, in the front interface. And at l even larger values of the array number, you have this large uh, 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 clockwise rotating uh, roll or salutal roll, which actually clobbers the background convection rolls. And the convection rolls then again reappear from from here, from the left of the front. So the Front actually kills the convection rolls here, but they reappear as the front properties. I can show you a movie real quick of this particular simulation, where you can see something which I like to call as galloping motion, like a horse galloping motion, where you have the concentration, which is basically, you know, it's propagating uh, towards the right. It's basically the products in red are lighter than the reactants in blue, which is why it wants to go up, but the convection rolls bring it down and you have this interesting kind of instability that happens. So, um, you know, we again calculated the mixing length and the front velocity for when there is convection. And the big takeaway was that the mixing length uh, remains steady for when there is convection. Um, and so for the plot on the left here, we are plotting the mixing length as a function of solidarity number. And the, uh, you know, these uh, open triangles are results from when there was no convection, no thermal convection. So what we find is that for when there is convection, the mixing length sits, sits steady for a long while. And after, after that, it kind of increases in value. And this scaling is also 0.5. But the big takeaway is that the mixing length actually is smaller than the mixing length when there was no convection. So the convection rolls, uh, rolls as if it squeezes the reaction front and does not let it grow uh, to the large extent that we saw for the solute um, The Actually, an opposite thing happens for the front velocity, where we saw that the front velocity again sits constant for a while, but then it increases. And we see that the front velocity actually, when there is convection, is larger than the corresponding value when there is no convection. So. Um, so the, the front velocity, so in summary, the front velocity increases because of better mixing when there is convection between the reactants and the products. However, the mixing length decreases because the convection rolls kind of do not allow the solute feedback roll to grow out um, and expand. So you can actually, so one way to visualize the complexity is something called the space-time plot. So if you take a slice here at the middle of the domain, you can actually plot something called the space-time plot, which is, you know, you are plotting your dynamics in time and in x-axis. So we are taking the uh, slice at the middle of the domain. Figure A is for when there is no convection and there is just a RAS value of 1,000. So you see a, a smooth transition from products to reactants. Now, the slope of this line will give you the front velocity. Um, the interesting thing here is that there is no structure to this space-time plot, so which tells us that the front is largely constant in in space as it propagates outward. Now, when there is convection, uh, when there is thermal convection but no solute feedback, we see this repeating uh, periodic structure here. Uh, now, here basically the solid lines are clockwise uh, rotating convection rolls and the uh, dashed lines are anti-clockwise for any convection rolls, uh, pre-existing convection rolls before the you know the front. So here again we see that the front here in the space-time plot we see that there is a structure, there is a repeating structure to be precise. So if you take any slice in time, we'll find 
or you know certain slices in time will find spatial variation in the computation but if you take if you take any slice in x though you do not find any temporal oscillation in the computation so in other words the concentration does not vary in uh, time at a particular region in space however the situation changes when there is both these effects so when convective when there is con thermal convection and also solute feedback you have this interesting kind of spatial temporal features in this kind of so here for example if you take any slice in time there is a uh, spatial variation but also interestingly if you take certain slices in x direction you see temporal variation in concentration of the of your species for larger values of feedback larger values of solute feedback we actually the space time plot again returns back to this uh, value or in other words the convection becomes irrelevant because the feedback is so strong uh, but still you have like wisp like structures here where where you can you know take a slice and you find uh, oscillation so actually for those slices you can actually plot the concentration as a function of time and we see here we have plotted like line plots of the concentration as a function of time we see that you know it's varying with time now this is an example of a emergent uh, dynamics so you know the temporal oscillations in the products are uh, and the reactants is an it's an important property of the non equilibrium chemical reactions and we can actually induce this behavior by just simply adding this solute feedback to the convection rows and this is an example of an emergent phenomena um this is uh, also an example of emergent phenomena of a similar reaction or uh, you know sim similar in the sense that it's also a quadratic uh, nonlinear reaction called the lewis zabotinsky reaction which is also a interesting nonlinear uh, physical chemistry experiment uh, now these results this was so far where are actually available in mukherjee and paul pre 2020 if uh, that is interest and we can also discuss more later on uh okay so now i'm going to talk about uh what happens when there is an exothermic reaction so if you have exothermic reaction um and suppose for so these simulations are only an exothermic reaction and there is no change in density between the products and the reactants you actually develop a pair of convection rows so because of a local hot spot at the front or at the reaction there is a pair of counter rotating convection rows that propagates for eta with the heat release parameter beta than the endothermic scenario is will be exactly opposite to to it because of the sign difference but interestingly no endothermic um, feedback reaction has been discovered so far uh, i was told uh, so you know the exothermic reaction is the one we we have modeled but you can easily you know study in the thermal reaction as well so exothermic reactions uh, develop a pair of counter rotating convection rows as you increase your heat release this pair actually becomes more and more asymmetric as you can see and it becomes skewed almost and the front shape also develops this interesting kind of knout like feature now these are all simulations where there is no background convection yet and we can again plot the variation of the fluid and the front velocity with eta where eta is our heat release parameter now we see that the fluid velocity changes from a linear to a quadratic Uh, or to a square root kind of variation, and the front velocity actually changes from a three and a half to a square root kind of variation. We do not have a reasonable explanation for this, um, you know, scalings at this point. But you know, a common or something that I'm working on is to do a perturbation expansion in the same uh, with the same idea, so a little feedback for this uh, to kind of quantify this interesting physics here as well. So. we can actually also we can study you know the uh, cooperative and antagonistic feedback now basically your thermal and solute feedback can occur together and they can give rise to two scenarios you can either have a cooperative feedback where your products are lighter than your reactants and the reaction is exothermic so both the effect of thermal and the solute feedback they want to reduce down the uh, density of the fluids whereas for the antagonistic scenario your products are heavier than the reactants and you know the reaction is still exothermic so there is a competing influence the reaction wants to reduce the density of the fluid whereas the heavier products the solute feedback wants to increase it so these terminology of cooperative and antagonistic were also you know uh, used by anedevit in their paper um as as well 
So, you know, we can see a couple of simulation for cooperative feedback and antagonistic feedback. You can see for, you know, for the cooperative feedback, the scenario is uh, the shape of the front is nearly steady, except for some dynamics here because of the heat relief. Whereas for the antagonistic feedback, the uh, situation is much more complicated as we saw in the in the switch simulation where we saw that the leading edge, there is a lot of dynamic effect. So what happens is that the leading edge is formed of heavier products which want to go down, uh, which basically fall down. However, the you know the exothermic reaction is always kind of trying to decrease the temperature. So it's completely competing at that. You can again plot the space time plot for this and we I've done so, and you know, for the corporate feedback, you see there is, you know, oscillation because of the you know, interesting dynamics behind the uh, snout of the front. Whereas for the antagonistic feedback, we see that there are jagged features in the space-time plot, and these jagged features are because of this heavier front snout, which falls down, tumbles down, and uh, forms this kind of jagged uh, feature. We can actually plot the front velocity uh, as a function of time for these plots. You see, for cooperative feedbacks, the fronts are faster because both the, you know, the, both the thermal and the solid feedback are not competing against each other. The cooperative. For the antagonistic feedback, the fronts are slower, and the nature of the dynamics, you know, there is a another mode to the dynamics that gets added to the oscillation, which is related to the tumbling down of the leading edge. And actually, visualize this using a space, uh, you know, using a phase portrait where you know. You can plot the acceleration of the front as a function of velocity. So you see that for the cooperative feedback, we just get an oval shape in which the dynamics evolve. Whereas for the antagonistic feedback, we have this two modal kind of an oscillation where the one of the modes is because of the heavier um, leading edge uh, of the front is from this down. So, you know, the cooperative and fe antagonistic feedback scenarios becomes way more complicated when there is a background convection. So you know, this is a cooperative feedback simulation when there is a background convection uh, uh, is present, and for the antagonistic feedback as well when there is in the presence of background convection. Now, this is a very complicated kind of scenario to quantify, but you know the big takeaways are that you know for cooperative feedback, all the effects are trying to reduce down the density of the uh, fluid. So you know the products are which are lighter density have you know you have a large extended regions of lighter products and you have a large mixing length. For the antagonistic feedback, the uh, the basically the leading edge, again, it forms, evolves, and because of the heaviness of the products, it tumbles down. However, because of the thermal instability, it again goes up. The space-time plots for these are very complicated. And interestingly, they do not, the dynamics does not settle down to a periodic behavior like you saw for when there was no convection. So, you know, the space-time plot for the, this is the cooperative scenario where both of these are the same sign and the antagonistic feedback are when they're of different signs. So, you know, the space-time plots are very complicated and these features do not repeat. So they are not periodic. It can also be visualized by plotting the front velocity where for the cooperative feedback, the front velocity is, you know, the signal is not periodic. Uh, but for the antagonistic feedback, there is some sort of structure which can also be visualized by the phase portraits again. For the cooperative feedback, like we saw, the phase portrait does not have any structure. However, for the antagonistic feedback, there is some sort of structure which is related to the tumbling down of the, you know, the leading edge of the front uh, uh, in the convective portion. So, you know, to we also studied, basically, these are all, you know, work in progress, but I'm going to share the Solute and then, you know the cooperative and antagonistic feedback in the presence of spiral defect chaos. So these are these are our chaotic flow fields at a number of six thousand, and this is the scenario which we studied in the first part where you have a front propagating with no feedback, so no coupling between the front. Uh, the front does not couple back to the flow field. There is always coupling between the flow field and the reaction pattern diffusion equation. However, this is a scenario where there is a solute feedback only. So, you know, no exothermicity, but the products are lighter than the reaction. So what happens here is that these, as the front property is outward, it reorients the convection rules and and forms straight parallel rolls in its way as it propagates. So you can see a chain of straight parallel rolls at very high kind of wave number, um, you know, which are crammed in between the space. 
And because since it's a high wave number, which is unstable for this particular state of convection, it kind of reverts back to the chaotic front again, um, you know, as the front is propagating. The you know, similar scenario for antagonistic and cooperative feedback, of course, these are also associated with heat release from the reaction, but overall the dynamics the same where, you know, as the front propagates, it clobbers the convection rolls and forms, you know, straight parallel rolls in its wake, which then again becomes unstable because of this instability here in the uh, dynamics. So here again, the concept, con the, in the wave number here for this rolls are about 2.3, whereas here it's about 3.8, which is outside the Busa balloon. Now the Busa balloon is a stability diagram for Rayleigh Banhart convection, which is the wave number versus the your you know the control parameter. So because this is outside the Busa balloon, it kind of reverts back to this chaotic uh, front here. Uh, so it's a you can say that it's a front of chaos that's propagating outward in this location here. You can also actually visualize the temperature field for the cooperative feedback here. And we see that as the front is propagating, um, you have this high temperature zone that's propagating out there. This is the temperature field where you know, the red is high temperature and blue is cold um, uh, temperature, cold fluid. So as the front propagates outward, it forms a, a hot zone which reorients the convection rolls, which then again turn back to the reverse back to the convection as um, to the convective instability because of the convective instability goes back to the uh, pattern that it was. So to end, I will just go a brief uh, study of pattern forming fronts, which we did. Now, fronts often propagate, leaving behind a trail of spatial structures. So suppose you have you know dendritic fronts or you know fronts of crystal growth. Now this is a front of convection work, which uh, we are studying. So we have a initially quiescent, uh, quiescent and steady state layer of fluid, where we have a hot sidewall here, and we increase the temperature difference little by little in the top and the bottom. So what happens is that there is a convection roll that forms here, and which propagates outward. You know, as you increase time, this convection roll propagates outward and you know reaches for the right wall. Now this is an example of a pattern forming front. And there's a lot of studies on on this uh, uh, on this front, and to quantify the velocity and especially the wavelength of this pattern that is selected behind by the front. Now we can actually, you know, this is a little simulation of this platforming front and how it evolves in time. So we actually plotted the front velocity as a function of the reduced parameter uh, or reduced real number. And as well as the wavelength of the pattern as a function of the digital phase. Now, for the front velocity, it uh, and we we actually studied this for a larger values of reduced rate number that has been studied than that has been uh, studied yet in the literature. So we used it for a relatively large value of uh, Rayleigh number. Um, beyond which, if you increase the Rayleigh number beyond this point, you basically the entire layer becomes convectively unstable. So the velocity of this front here is can be quantified using this uh, relation here, which is derived from the amplitude equation uh, from you know physics principles. Whereas the wavelength here, although cannot be derived, or you know as as our results suggest, and also this Feinberg and Steinberg uh, experiment suggest, it was not derived from this amplitude equation, and instead it follows this kind of a weak uh, you know negative exponential. Uh, or negative um, a trend of epsilon to the power of one half, where um, you know the solid line is basically this fit here, uh, following uh, Feinberg and Steinberg. So we could not resolve why this uh, fit was not following the amplitude equation. For that, we have to go even lower values of you know the epsilon or the reduced values of reduced rate number. But up, our results show that for a large uh, value of reduced Rayleigh numbers, the wavelength and the velocities can be, the wavelength can be estimated using the Feinberg and Steinberg relation, and the velocity can be estimated using the amplitude equation. So in conclusion, we saw that the front velocity is dependent on the competing influence of the orientation and the geometry, uh, which, you know, gives rise to fractal. Um, and then, you know, the solutal feedback, we studied solutal feedback and how it kind of, you have temporal self-organized dynamics because of it. And we also studied heat release um, 
you know, uh, which you know, which can create a pair of contrary convection rules, and these two feedbacks can occur together uh, to yield oscillatory antagonistic and property feedback. And lastly, we also studied pattern forming from some convection rules, and we actually saw we studied this in a larger range of ray numbers that has than that has been studied in literature. So these are my acknowledgments. I'd like to um, especially acknowledge my, you know, department of Virginia Tech, engineering mechanics department, and you know the Virginia Tech computing um, infrastructure, advanced research and computing. All these simulations were actually done in a Cray cluster uh, with you know about on the order of 3,000 processors, parallel processing um, capabilities of advanced research and computing are uh, very very useful. And we used NEC 5000, which is an open source spectral element fluid solver to do all the simulation we have our in-house code and we, you know developed or you know we modified our code as we go for for doing this simulation and i'll also thank my lab mates as well as paul fisher of next 5000 so, um to end i will just share a brief couple of slides on the research that i'm doing right now so right now i'm a postdoc in university of minnesota uh, in the jeff t hop lab and basically jeff t hop is uh, is he's an experimentalist and he actually does experiments in the mouse brain. So what we are trying to kind of quantify is transport in the brain essentially. So I'm gonna first show you this uh, schematic here taken from paper where you have, so this is your, suppose your brain cortex and the red is your artery, the blue is veins in your cortex. So what has been discovered recently is that there are annual spaces, annular spaces around your arteries and the veins where the cerebrospinal fluid, which is a fluid, which is colorless fluid that flows in your brain, it propagates or it flows through these annular channels. Now, this the motion of the cerebrospinal fluid has been shown to clear out waste products from the brain because the neural neurons in your brain constantly metabolize. And uh, so it's very interesting. The brain actually... Uh, it actually it's responsible for 20% of your metabolic energy. So it's a highly functioning uh, thing and it constantly releases waste products. To, to clear that out, we have the cerebrospinal fluid in our brain, which, which you know flows through these spaces around the arteries and the veins and it seeps into the cortex and it clears out the you know solute uh, and the toxic proteins, amyloid beta that gets released when you what I'm doing right now is I'm doing kind of porous media simulation. So if you take a slice here, and uh, between a penetrating artery and a penetrating vein, I'm studying how the clearance happens of, you know, initially uh, concentration of, let's say, a toxic uh, you know, product in this domain. So we are, again, using a variation of the reaction diffusion equation where this is actually a, now a reaction direction at, uh, aggregation equation where F is the aggregation of the protein. So I'm studying how the flow kind of clears out the waste product between these two channels of artery, penetrating arteriole and, you know, penetrating many. And the second thing that I'm studying is called spreading depolarization. So uh, so uh, one, one thing that I forgot to add here, which will be interesting, is that, you know, this waste clearance in the brain is extremely important because if the waste clearance is not good, then you develop Alzheimer's disease. And, and, and dementia. So these interstitial solutes in the brain, they basically aggregate and they can form higher molecular weight aggregates, which if not cleared, they form flux and oligomers and toxic um, amyloid beta pep, uh, you know, polymers, which actually block your, literally block your brain and you cannot remember things because the dementia. So this, this clearance is extremely important. I'm trying to quantify that. And the second thing is called spreading depolarization. So during, after stroke, what happens, there is a wave of uh, chemical activity in your brain. So there is a wave of chemical uh, chem uh, chemicals that, you know, uh, neurochemical activity that uh, a wave uh, that propagates outward from, you know, from the region which was responsible for stroke. And this happens in stroke, this happens in migraine. So you have this wave uh, is shown in green here. Um, Called the spreading depolarization because it depolarizes the neurons. Neurons are essentially negatively charged cells or batteries. So as this wave propagates, it actually depolarizes the neurons. So neurons are not capable of, you know, signaling again. 
So, and this, you know, this uh, state of depolarization uh, gets fixed after stroke, and that's how people survive. But you know, for example, uh, people die when this uh, uh, this brain depolarization wave completely kills the neuronal activity, and there is no recovery. Mm -hmm. So I'm also trying to uh, study this spreading depolarization using a reaction diffusion equation. Again, a variation of reaction diffusion equation. Here, K plus is the extracellular concentration of potassium. So I'm kind of modeling how this spreading depolarization reaction diffusion wave propagates outward. So this is a fic fictional or not. Uh, so let's say a hypothetical, you know, portion of the brain cortex, six millimeter times six millimeter, two dimensional brain cortex. And these are preliminary simulation which shows the uh, you know, as the concentration of the extracellular potassium, which increases as the wave propagates um, outward. So I'm going to end here. And you know, it's probably a long discussion, but, you know, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you, Saikat. It's It was really very interesting. Uh, and uh, the floor is now open for discussion and questions. So I will just see the chat. Uh, I think there are two questions, which is interesting. Okay. Uh, I think one is from Vishnu, and if you are uh, here, you can unmute and ask. So the questions I am telling at large rally number does large scale circulation occur? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I am Vishnu here. Yeah, it's a nice talk, and I, I think I, I was wrong in question because I didn't realize that it was a slender domain. So basically, I thought it was like a longer domain with a single recirculation the domain in the flow. So in your case, you are getting many such uh, kind of large scale circulations, right? Vishnu, I'm having a little trouble uh, actually huh. hearing you. But um, so so you want to understand uh, if if there is large scale circulation at high daily numbers, is that correct? Hi, yes, yes. Okay, so basically, it's it's a very interesting question, and thanks for you know firstly bringing this up. You know, so uh, large values of Rayleigh numbers actually, um, you know, there 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 have been studies where there are some large scale spatial fluid structures, but these structures are not what what let's say these structures are not what's important. So as you increase the Rayleigh number, you actually your spatial or your fluid. Um, scales, you have a range of scales because, you know, that, that's the characteristic of turbulence because you have a range of spatial scales. So mainly you have, you, you do have that large, uh, large scale features of fluids, but you also have like very small scale features, which were, you know, which we saw in the oscillations, you know, this sp uh, spatial oscillation. So you have a, so, and these, this is not even turbulent flow. This is just beginning to, you know, in the route to, turbulence but for high daily number flows you do get a scale of you know a scale of uh, spatial and temporal scales uh, for very large values of daily number this is a discussion um, you know you can check some work uh, by Janet Scheel uh, who does a lot of high daily number simulations uh, from the simulations that I have done I have not seen too large uh, spatial structure it's just the uh, that we have seen more and more small structures which get added to the flow flow feed. Okay, so can, can I one? Yeah, sure, sure, Vishnu. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Other question was related to the two chaotic regimes which you showed, uh, yeah. in which uh, the uh, for the front velocities. Like in one yeah. regime, I think uh, you are mentioning about the uh, the known orientation of the uh, rolls which causes some reduction yeah. in velocity in the regime. Yeah. The, uh, the chaotic dimension increase the box dimension increase uh, to fractal and that's why there's an increase uh, uh, front velocity right yeah yeah that's true uh, but, uh, why do they happen time uh, like they can happen in both regimes like, like in any in, 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 in chaotic regime it can have fractal uh, success as well as uh, the non orientation of the roll right so it may be yeah, a competition between yeah i'm just thinking why you explain one for the one regime, the other for the other regime. Why can't they both happen in all the regimes? Like in yeah, both so regimes. both of the, you, you are you are correct. Both of these happen at at all times. Um, you are you are correct. But the dominating effect in these two regimes are the ones I mentioned. So for high values oh, of Rayleigh number, oh. sorry. 
why does one dominate in one region and the other? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good question. So the, you know, I think this plot will be interesting. So you know, for high values of or large values of Rayleigh number, uh, we also plotted the you know the phi or the orientation angle and the front velocity, and we saw that the front velocity was not too dependent on the orientation as it was for you know lower values of Rayleigh number in the chaotic regime. Uh, the reason we thought was that you know at some point the oscillations oscillatory instability takes over so the geometry of the front becomes more important than the orientation of the convection rules uh, in that regime but for weak or for lower values of Rayleigh number we still have that weak trend and we still the orientation is still important but you are correct the fractal dimensions if we saw if we see the fractal dimension as uh, you know increasing with the Rayleigh number we can see that the fractal, the fronts become fractal before uh, you know it hits that uh, oscillatory instability. So these are competing influences, but one dominates the other in um, in these uh, two regimes. I don't know if that answered answers your questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Saikat, I have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, yeah. I mean, not questions. It's like queries. Uh, so, uh, can you go back to the, your initial governing equation slide? So, if sure. I'm right, so the type of nonlinearity you have chosen, it's very similar to the logistic map e equation, right? That is true. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my question is that, like, do you see any such universal root that we see for the logistic map equation here? Mm -hmm. And do you have, like, uh, have you looked for such universal constant, like Feigenbaum constant? Mm. Uh, no. Like, mm, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, is there any such universal root? That is the question. Yeah. So, so you are right, uh, right that this, you know, this is a logistic map equation. So if you time evolve this equation, uh, you will find essentially routes, you know, bifurcation routes. And yes. You will see Feigenbaum's constant. But for us, basically, we have not, uh, you know, studied that. And uh, this, this for us is just a production term. And we don't really go into that kind of a bifurcation regime. For that, I think I have to probably simulate, um, you know, fronts, which are, uh, so th this this is okay. a one way route, right? So this is the state of C equal to one is a steady uh, product. So the state of C equal to zero is unstable with this reactant. So you have a one way propagation of front from C equal to one to C equal to zero. So we do not see any um, uh, routes to chaos or you know fiber bound constant in our. No, but uh, why do you call it one way? It's two way, right? If I am correct, like I didn't understand why are you calling it one way? Oh, so the reason I call it one way is that suppose you have a petri dish of uh, reactants, okay, mm. and you you release a, a small quantity of product in the middle of that reaction. So what will happen is that there the product will, the dynamics will evolve such that the products uh, completely devour the existing reactants in the domain, unless you fee com constantly feed the domain with reactants. So you will have a one way propagation of from the, from the state of reactants to products and not vice versa. I see. Okay. okay. So that's why I'm, I'm saying. And what is problem. what is the role of uh, this coupling coefficient, the zeta, uh, in this oh, right. transition group? This one, or yes, uh, yes, that one. Yeah. Okay. So this is a uh, this is a kind of a heat release parameter. So we are saying that you know if your chemical reaction is exothermic. Uh, mm -hmm. then it will release heat and that will show up in the in your energy equation so we are basically adding this term here uh, c times 1 minus c which is the concentration the production same production term as the, as the you know the concentration and it gets added to the temperature equation because you know the exothermic exothermicity of the reaction increases the temperature which again modifies the flow field so this is another way of coupling or another way of uh, visualizing or you know quantifying feedback yeah so so basically uh, this eta, eta and zeta these are like temperature and the concentration equation they are coupling each other uh, in terms of c so my question is like you saw you showed a nice effect of uh, thermal convection on chaos right like the propagation of chaotic fronts depends on the uh, degree of convection so does this coupling coefficient, like uh, mm -hmm. if we increase it, so yeah. does this transition scenario changes? Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't actually 
increased or done a bunch of simulation with increasing the value of eta. We have actually, um, I mean, the simulations that I've done, I have not, see, I have just seen that it kind of, uh, you know, reorients the chaotic flow field and it reorients it in okay. the spirals and it kind of reverts back to the chaotic regime. But, you know, increasing the eta from my intuition, what I can tell you is that what it will do is that it will release, you know, a, a lot of uh, uh, heat, right? And mm -hmm. it will basically uh, increase the speed of the front as well as it will increase the, you know, the orient or it will basically disintegrate the background uh, chaos, basically. Okay, I see. So I see. it will, uh, but it will, it will revert back at some point. Um, so this is also an example of chemical control of chaos. So you can actually change small chemical parameters to control, you know, chaos or in the regime. Now, another interesting thing that I probably did not cover in the talk, but, you know, this ETA, since you brought it up, uh, this ETA, there is some, um, you know, or we have to be careful in increasing the ETA such that, you know, we cannot, you know, kill the business approximation. So if eta is increased indefinitely, the business approximation will not be valid then because the, the you know the heat release is so much that we cannot then say that it's still incompressible. So we have to be careful in that regard yeah. as well. Sure. So that that puts a limit on that. So another thing is like when you uh, saw the fractal propagation of the wave front in a chaotic medium. Yeah. So you you I see that you have found out the fractal dimension. So did you check for multifractality by any chance, like whether multifractality is present in this case? No, uh, I have not. Um, so these are these are all box counting dimensions, and we get yes just one value of box counting. So for this figure here, we just get one value of box counting dimension. With of course the standard deviations are there, but we do get just one value by back multifactorly do you mean the like multiple values or yeah so that's that, that is another class of fractal structure where uh yeah so it's it's basically multiple fractal dimensions can be present so there are mm -hmm. separate analysis procedure i mean it can be interesting to you you can look into it like if it is present so okay. it doesn't it is not necessary that multifractality will be present in all types of chaos or chaotic yeah. transition yeah but it seems like it can it can be an interesting path like you can check for it if it is free. yeah yeah i mean for i i can discuss with you i mean what are the yeah. toolboxes for there are uh, certain toolboxes for analyzing uh, if yeah. there is multifactality so. yeah i think from my intuition what i can tell you is that since this is just one structure of front mm -hmm. interface so we i i do not know how the implication of multifractality will come in this scenario so you have just one structure right and you want to calculate the fractal dimension of that particular structure. Uh, yes. So, True. Yeah. yeah. But we, we, we will, we can discuss later on. Yes, uh, sure. sure. Yeah. So another interesting, I mean, I was wondering this spatial defect here, that is very interesting. Spiral thing. defect. So, yeah. uh, a spiral, uh, sorry, spiral defect here. So what is the degree of chaos here? Like, oh, what is the, can you mention the value of Lyapunov coefficient? Is it like weak level or high level? Uh, what is the value of Lyapunov coefficient generally, typically? So the value of the Lyapunov exponent. So you actually get a spectrum of values, and it's not a not just yeah. one value. Yes, the, I mean I'm talking about largest Lyapunov exponent, LL, okay. the uh, maximum. I mean order just. I'm just because I was thinking like, is it a weak level of chaos or it's very highly chaotic? Because you talk to the root to transition from chaos, right? So. Yeah. And that's this, kind of intra interesting yeah, yeah that's that's the that's the scenario here where you know you if you increase keep increasing your control parameter you eventually go hit the that route to chaos uh, for the the range for the spectrum of lyapunov exponents i i actually do not remember on the top of my head okay, okay. Uh, yeah but, anyway we can discuss it later yeah i will i will get back to you um, yeah, so uh, I was more sorry. interested like when the chaos transitions to turbulent, uh, yeah. completely turbulent flow, like yeah. if the wave propagates and interacts with this chaotic uh, interactions, mm. do you see a similar energy cascade, uh, which is typically seen in the transition to turbulence, like the yeah. ADs, uh, breakdown of ADs yeah. or something yeah. like that? Yeah, you should see that. Um, 
I haven't done those simulations, but you know there are people who have done the relevant art convection with, you know, okay. studying tur turbulence, and they have uh, quantified that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So another question which I had and uh, Vignes asked in the chat box that yeah. you showed that uh, for a certain scenario I forgot after chaotic scenario there is a oscillatory instability, right? Uh, uh, for the first case. Let's see. For the first case, so oscillatory instability. Yeah, so after chaotic uh, window, there is oscillatory instability. So uh, this, does this oscillatory instability uh, brings back chaos or it is like the chaos is no more observed after no, that? No, it is that. still chaotic. No, the oscillatory instability is still chaotic. It's still spatially okay. chaotic and you still get a yield yield spectrum of positively upon of exponents. Um, so it's it's it is still chaotic. It does not it is not um, yeah it does not uh, go get rid of the chaos. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that was one thing. Other thing I noted down. Yeah. So uh, can you go to your slide nine? Slide nine. Yeah. Here I I have a question. Like you told that the for the chaotic region. Uh, I think, yeah, chaotic regime you averaged for three simulations, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, for uh, so, so I was wondering, like, do we miss any uh, physics in that by averaging out? Like, because for chaotic flow, every uh, iteration or every simulation, it should be a different simulation uh, yeah. if your initial condition is different. So, yeah. like, how valid is it to average three different simulations? So the reason for averaging three different simulations is just just like you said, right? So, uh, so these are three front uh, simulations which are about you know hundred time units apart, and mm -hmm. the reason for doing so initially was to actually study was to actually actually see that you know do different patterns give rise to different velocities. Uh, yes. But but then we uh, we were intending to compare this with uh, steady convection uh, rolls, right? So mm -hmm. these these data points here are for steady value of um, you know steady patterns where you have just one value of Rayleigh number, you, you just spits out one value of front velocity, one value of fluid velocity, right? So okay. so we wanted to compare these simulations with that uh, simulation. So just to be you know just to show our readers that you know these are still chaotic simulations and we do uh, some kind of an an average of three simulations to get uh, to kind of uh, just to just to convince ourselves that this transition is is still happening. You know, it's not like we have uh, used a different. We have used an initial condition such that we get a larger value of front velocity uh, okay. than than um, the corresponding equivalent velocity for the uh, straight parallel rows. So that is the reason why we used three. Uh, simulation and we average them, but that's a good question. I uh, we can in in um, in theory. I mean, we can actually do even more simulations, but they, they become very computationally expensive. Uh, yeah, exactly. That that was my question. Like, if we increase the number of psych uh, number of simulations in the averaging part, since it's chaotic, will yeah. this measure change or they will remain statistically? Similar? No, no, they will they will still remain statistically similar. Okay, I see. But but just to you know study that you know this change in initial condition or change in different patterns does not change this. Uh, we still have this kind of slow Trained. slow down yeah. of chaotic tokens. We did this kind of three runs one after the other. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's all I could note down. I mean, I had queries, so I'm done with it. I, I will request uh, the present participants again. If you have any question, you can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, yes. So so I have uh, two quick questions for Spikat. Uh, it's hey, Edward. Edward. Thanks uh, for attending the talk. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a great talk. And well, thank you for spending up at 1 a.m. in Minneapolis. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my first question is about the first part of your talk. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to, I think, the reaction angle phi, right? Yeah. Um, so we have shown numerically uh, the dependence of the uh, front velocity uh, yeah. on phi. 
Yeah. But is it also something that uh, you could expect or you could infer somehow from, from the equation? I, I don't know if you did any kind of asymptotic mm. analysis to kind of infer that, but I, I also don't, don't know how simple that would be. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't done that. Uh, it's a short, short answer, but mm. you know, it, it would be interesting. I, I think you are seeing that from the equations itself, you can somehow infer the relation of velocity, front velocity and the P, right? Yeah, like some yeah. relation between you know the the wave vector of the pattern and uh, and phi right and the velocity. Yeah, so no, I haven't I haven't seen that. I I mean I haven't done that. I, that would be interesting to okay. dig into. Yeah. The... Because like you know uh, here you you have something a bit more complicated and because uh, usually when uh, you no know, we're dealing with free libanar and then you. you uh, you, you can think of using Swift Cohen back to get some of these uh, analytic expressions. But uh, yeah. when they have a reaction, then it, uh, they, this kind of like reduction process, they become a bit more complicated. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have to use this kind of, you know, tools uh, to kind of quantify them. And, you know, the, one of the complications about that, uh, this fee, although uh, Eduardo is that it's actually averaged in a spatial region. So, you know, the front is, has a finite thickness. So the P is defined in this finite thickness region, which is again average here. So the angle bracket P is the average of this, for example. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Spatial average. So it's, it's, it's slightly complicated. I do not see how to derive this from the equations itself. Maybe somehow, so I have, the, what I've tried is before is that, you know, I have taken the pattern and I have com computed the wave number of the pattern. Mm -hmm. And also I have computed the tangent you know, or the radial direction to the front. And that is mm -hmm. how I actually compute the fee um, in, uh, in reality. Um, so that, that, that's how I actually compute the, the action zone angle. Basically, I take the pattern, I compute the wave vectors, direction and the front interface, and then I take the radial slice and you know calculate the angle between them. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Probably it's not not so easy. Uh, and my, my my second question is related to, to the last part of your talk, the yeah. uh, pattern forming uh, reaction from yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it was just is this is this the one? Yeah. This one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just curious about like the resulting curvatures. I don't know if it was something you look at that because you know there. It's curious there. So there seems to be some relation between like the uh, this resulting uh, convection rows and uh, local curvatures and the, the wavelength. But uh, my, my question in particular is, is like if you look at into like the resulting curvatures, if if there's like any kind of role the uh, th these curvatures are playing, or they are like more of a result of the process. Yeah. So I think these they are a result of the process. So you know the spatial, um, you know the spatial distribution of this wave uh, pattern. The you know, this the spatial distribution actually uh, uh, governs the curvature of these patterns because you know this is just a it it's a confined geometry, right? So the so, so the spatial um, uh, distribution of this pattern, the wavelength of the pattern, actually governs the curvature. So that's why we were more interested on, you know, finding the wavelength or the wave number that gets left behind by the, or that gets selected by the front behind. It would probably be more, in, you know, or universally informative. And, but I haven't looked at the local curvature. Maybe that, that will also be useful. But I, I think it can be derived, you know, if you know the, your wavelength and you know the uh, size of the domain, you can actually yeah. calculate the number of some number of patterns and, and probably calculate the curvature out of that. Yeah, because yeah. that's, I mean, for, for the, the, the one, only thing I saw here is like, you know, I, as typically, you know, have regions of, let's say, positive curvature, the flow is going out, and regions of negative, the flow is going in, or vice mm -hmm. versa. Right? But I, I don't know if like the, um, the, there's some actual relation with the wavelength for, but as you said, there is a confined geometry, so these things they always get. Uh, mix yeah, it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what I mean is that the curvature is determined by the distribution of the patterns, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the dist distance between these two peaks, for example, you know, will determine the 
these curvature because it's a confined right yeah. right yeah. so so if you know the wavelength or the wave number you have some information or some intuition about what those geometries will be yes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah 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 they, they're more a result of the process yeah yeah mm -hmm. all right thanks that's all yeah thanks okay. thanks for okay yeah so thank you everyone for joining in again with different time zones i'm really thankful and it was very interesting talk like so we are looking forward to more discussions personally so yeah so if there are no more questions uh, i will conclude and close this session thank you again yeah thank you thank you everyone for attending and if you have any questions feel free to email me my email should be uh, is it in the website or i don't know you can you can find it in my you know in my website so yeah just sure. just shoot me an email i'll be happy to discuss more and i'll be happy to you know answer your questions and thank you for the opportunity on the uh, it's okay i mean uh, we will looking forward to more interesting talks so if again any of your friends are interesting interested to give a talk they can contact us sounds good okay okay see thank you me. guys so bye and closing the session thank you okay sounds good thank you Thank you.